why it's important and all that good stuff. So thank you for coming today, Dr. Whitmore. Good to see some familiar faces, not everybody's familiar. So I was thinking about it, and it's like a lot of you have had in class before, so you've heard some of this. So but many of you haven't, maybe someday, I don't know. Um, so it was going to be on what is virtue, but I decided to change it to um, how can you grow virtue as someone in college, or in high school, or in homeschooling, or really anywhere else, right? So a nice compact title here. Uh, but we're still going to have to address what virtue is, just so we can talk about it. So I'm going to give some general advice on how I think you can grow in virtue in those circumstances, which is every circumstance, right? Um, and then when we open up for Q&A, we can get maybe a little more, in, more detail in the questions, more specific in the questions. But uh, simply put, a virtue is just a perfection of our character, right? So that's just a very simple way of putting it. It's a perfection of our character. Um, but the way we hear virtue today, like when it ever gets brought up, we don't hear the word too often. It's usually a negative connotation, right? So we hear, we think of those platitudes, like, oh, virtue is its own reward, or patience is a virtue, we roll our eyes at that. Or we hear virtue signaling, right? <laughs> so these companies that they'll post something on Facebook or they'll do something to just signal like, oh yeah, we're with it, we're good, don't boycott us. Um, sometimes it actually is a good thing. Most of the time I think it's, Probably not. It's things that the church wouldn't consider virtue, but virtue signaling still has this negative connotation, right? We want to bring it back to its positive connotation because virtue is this great thing. I mean, really, virtue is a perfection of our character. This is what makes us most free. It's what makes us most human. It's what makes us most ourselves. I think it's virtue. It's going to be, as we're going to talk about, a perfection of our character. It's going to kind of coordinate all the different abilities and capacities we have as human persons so that we can act with that freedom. Um, and as we'll see, with ease and enjoyment. So let's kind of look at that um, definition a little bit more closely. So I said a perfection of a character would be more precise and say it's a perfection of a power. Now, what is a power? We think of all the superhero movies and superpowers, right? Well, here we're just talking about basically capacities. So um, the philosophy behind the soul is that the soul has these different capacities, different things that it can do. Some of them we have control over, some of them we don't. So like we don't have control over our digestion, we don't have control over our five senses as, as much as I wish we could, right? So just like will, 2020 vision, that'd be awesome. Um, but other ones we do have control over, um, like our thinking. We can choose to think about some things and not think about others. We can choose to stop thinking about something we're thinking about. Uh, so that's our intellect, our will. We have the ability to choose in general. Or even our emotions. Sometimes they seem out of our control, we just respond to something in a certain way, but actually, we do have some control over that, right? So if somebody slights me, I can choose to get angry, or I can choose to let it go, forgive it. Uh, but then over time, I can actually, those emotional responses that are just automatic, maybe like fear or something, we can train ourselves to make them more reasonable, to kind of redirect them, as it were. So these would be the powers of the soul that we're talking about, right? Our intellect, our will, our emotions. Um, and so a virtue is gonna be a perfection of one of these powers. Right? bringing these powers in accordance with reason, right? In accordance with truth. So we make our, what we think about in accord with truth, what we choose in accord with truth, and this makes it good as well. It makes us good. So really, like, if you want the textbook theological definition of a virtue, it's a habitual and stable disposition to do the good that makes us possessor. Let's just break that down quickly. Uh, habitual and stable. So again, this is a description of our character. It is our character. And so our character is something that we take with us everywhere we go, right? It is us. It's consistent. So it's not like this one-off good act. And so we do some amazing thing. Um, it could have been amazing. It could have been a virtuous act. It doesn't make us virtuous, right? It could have been coincidence. Maybe I didn't even know that it was a good thing. Maybe I actually thought it was a bad thing, and that's why I chose it, right? We could be that confused. Uh, so it has to be stable and habitual, right? It's something that's regular. It's something that we develop over time. It has to be something good, right? It's not going to be virtuous, it's bad, and it would be vicious. But it also makes us good. So in this process of choosing the good, it's actually going to make us into better people. As I said at the beginning, it makes us freer, it makes us more human, it makes us more ourselves, right? What we were created to be, or we're called to be. So this is what happens as we develop virtue. Now, unless we're born without original sin, we aren't born with perfect virtue. So all of us, when we were born, we have certain natural dispositions towards some virtues, but also towards some vices. Some things come easy to us, maybe patience. Other things, bad things maybe come easy to us, like getting too angry too quickly. 
So there are certain things that we'll have to work on. So virtue is something that we have to acquire over time. Uh, but a lot of times when we think of acquiring virtue, if we think of it at all, um, we think of them as things, right? So often, for us to conceptualize these abstract concepts, we try to make them physical and tangible, and we think of virtues as things, right? Like, I've got to collect them all or something. Oh, I need uh, <laughs> fortitude and prudence and temperance, right? I want the full collection. Uh, like my son right now with his, he's got Paw Patrol finger puppets, and <laughs> there were five in the set, although there were six main characters, but there are actually like 10 characters or so, and he went to a birthday party, and there were two more that he could get. So now all I talk to is the one he doesn't have, right? But anyway, that's a side. We'll just pack it back to that. So um, they're not things we need to acquire. We acquire a lot of things, like Paw Patrol finger puppets, right? We acquire, especially when you have kids, you acquire a lot of things. And when the grandparents come and see the grandkids, you acquire even more things, right? But virtues aren't things like this that we acquire. They're not tangible. They're descriptions of our character. So we can still talk about acquiring them, attaining them, but it's going to be in a different sort of way. So this is the way we usually talk about it, like she has prudence, or he has fortitude, right? But it's more accurate actually to say she's prudent, or he's fortitudinous, or he's courageous, right? It's the word we usually use. Um, so that's actually the more accurate. It's a description of our character. Now, how do we do this? I mean, simply put, we develop virtue by doing virtuous things. We have to act in virtuous ways, and then that becomes um, stable and reliable in us, and then over time, that becomes our character. So basically, we have to imitate what true virtue is, as we practice that, then we grow and develop. So an analogy I want to use kind of throughout this talk is actually with uh, weightlifting, exercising, right? So we can think of muscles and lifting weights in order to gain muscle or to build muscle. So the muscles here would kind of be like the powers of the soul. We have our body, we've got all these different muscles that we can use, just like we have the soul, and there are these different powers or capacities through which we can act. Now, if we want to, and then virtue will be the same as strength here, right, in the analogy. So we build up our muscles so that we're strong. We want to kind of build up the powers of the soul so that they're virtuous. Now, when you're lifting weights, there are many different ways you could do it, right? You could start and say, all right, here we go. One pound weight. You do your 10 reps, and you put it down. And then the next day, all right, one pound weight, 10 reps, put it down. And you do that day after day, week after week, month after month, and you never increase the weight, you never increase the number of reps. Or we really say it's a strong person. <laughs> right? They're, they're exercising every day, they're lifting weights every day, but they're not strong. Right? So if they wanted to become strong, they're going to have to increase the weight or increase the reps. So they start with one pound maybe, maybe your natural disposition is you're a little stronger. You start with a three pound weight, right? And then you move up to five the next week, Why and then you move up to ten. <laughs> maybe you can even get up to like a thirty pound weight, right, with the curls. And by then you're starting to some, build some biceps, right, you're getting stronger. Um, and so that's good, right? You've now attained a stronger muscle, you have greater strength. And if you stay at that level, you'll probably stay at that strength. If you keep increasing, it'll keep increasing. But maybe you say, all right, this is getting a little out of hand. Like, it's taking me so long to do these reps, do these sets. Let's just cut it back. I'll go back to the 10 pound weight because I can get through that a little faster. But you can do that, but you're gonna become weaker, right? That muscle is gonna kind of go back down and you're gonna lose some of that strength. So virtue is gonna be similar in that regard. It's something that we have to practice and it's something that has to be maintained. So we'll take the first example, right? The one pound weights. So if I just hold the door for people, right? That's a good thing, it's polite. But if that's all I do, I just hold doors for people. But then when I talk to them, I insult them. Like I won't say hi, I talk about them behind their backs, right? I actually like do things to hurt them, maybe, things like that. But I hold the door for them. Right? I'm not gonna be virtuous, right? I'm just holding the door, that's kinda like the least you could do. But if I do want to go in virtue, maybe I am this misanthrope, this total curmudgeon, right? I hate people, but I want to be virtuous, so I can identify that's a good thing that I should want. Maybe I'll start with holding the doors, right? My natural disposition is kind of the best thing I can do right now. And hopefully over time I can say, you know what, I can also say hi. <laughs> I can also talk to you without insulting you. <laughs> and then in time, maybe I can even like actively do things for you to help you, right? And I can grow in that virtue, right? So you need to do that, start growing in virtue, start with these small things, you get better and better, do acts that are of greater virtue and greater virtue, just like you keep getting heavier weights. But let's say you attain virtue, you're a patient person, you're a temperate person, you know, you eat your, your square meals, healthy meals, you get to bed on time, you, um, 
treat other people with respect, you're patient, but then you think, but I can indulge right now, right? Like, I'm patient, but I really still don't like talking to this person, so I'm just gonna cut them off this time. And so you just kind of cut them off, I gotta go, right? In the, assuming that you don't have a just reason to do that, right? I know there are different circumstances. But let's just say you do that, right? And then you're like, hey, I felt good, right? I got out of that one. So next time, <laughs> next time you're talking with them, you cut them off again, maybe even a little sooner, right? So now you're starting to do less good things, right? So it might be good, you're still talking to them, but now it's less. It's not as virtuous as it was before. Same thing, if you start going down with the weights, right? Lighter weights, you're going to lose that muscle, you're going to lose that strength. Same thing here, once you start to do things that are less virtuous, you're going to lose that virtue. It's something that needs to be maintained. And it might start to develop into a vice, which is going to be this imperfection of power, right? It's going to kind of determine us in this habit of doing bad things, things that are against goodness or against truth that make us bad. All right, so we've got this analogy with um, weights and muscles, right? Let's say a little bit more before we get into some advice here. Let me just put me out real quick. <coughs> Oh yeah, okay, so when we talk about increase in virtue, what are we talking about? Like, what's increasing here? Because we already said it's not a thing, it's a description of our character. So the technical term for it is, in order to grow in virtue, you must act beyond the intensity of your virtue. All right, so what does that mean at all? Don't think of it in a quantity, like as a quantity, think of it as a quality, right? So it's a description. You have to act beyond the intensity of your virtue. So the intensity is pretty much the rational mode. So here I am like, what's intensity mean? Rational mode, what does rational mode mean? Right? I'm just replacing it with other confusing terms. But let me try to get to what I'm actually uh, meaning here. So you have to act beyond the intensity of your virtue in order to grow that virtue. The intensity is the rational mode. So earlier I said that a virtue is something that's in accordance with truth, right? So our knowledge, our prudence is gonna help dictate what is virtuous. Um, so another way of putting it is a virtue is a way of acting reasonably. And a vice is a way of acting unreasonably. There are different ways that we can act unreasonably, right? Reasonably means to do the right thing at the right time, the right way, to the right people, to the right degree, right? All these different things. But we can err and be unreasonable in different ways, um, according to different aspects. Usually we would call them by deficiency or excess, right? So for example, uh, the virtue of courage, this is the virtue that moderates our emotions of uh, fear and daring. So basically, the person with courage is the person who fears the right things and is daring about the right things and has the right amount of fear about the things that should be feared. But a coward is somebody who has too much fear and not enough daring. And somebody who's foolhardy is a person who has too much daring and not enough fear. Right? So they're unreasonable in that way. They might get lucky, the foolhardy person. A lot of times we're like, oh, what a hero. You dove into the burning building or you dove into the pool of sharks and saved the person. <laughs> it was great that it worked out. But if you're not trained in fire safety, if you're not trained in shark wrangling, right, it probably <laughs> wasn't a prudent thing to do. Right, so you just got lucky. You didn't have enough fear. You had too much daring in that regard. Okay, so we even see this, um, so we've got these excesses of, uh, or extremes of excess and deficiency, these ways of being unreasonable. And so virtue is trying to make it so that what we do is reasonable. The analogy, I think, carries over with the weight training here. So you could have, deficiency, right? You don't use muscles at all and they start to atrophy, right? So that you can't really use them anymore. But even excess, right? You can just like keep, like you ever seen those people? I don't, I could do this. I don't think I look any bigger actually, but pretend I'm really buff right now. So the point where like I don't have a neck anymore. <laughs> my shoulders are above my ears. <laughs> and I can't actually close my hand. <laughs> Because my finger muscles are so large. I've heard that this, I don't know if it's true, I've heard that this is half full players, like they can't pick up a pencil anymore because they, they like, the muscles get in the way and they can't close the hand. I don't know, I've heard. People it. can't scratch their ears because the bicep is too big. So. <laughs> oh, that would be so frustrating. So, this would kind of be analogously, right, a deficiency and an excess. Um, right? And, and, and that's going to impede other things. So we can see how there's. I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody's a biologist here that could tell me, are all of the muscles connected to each other? I know that like, some are connected to each other. So for instance, I didn't think so. So for instance, if you don't have strong abs, you can get back pain, right? So it might be good to build abs so that you don't have that back pain. But some of the muscles are connected, 
And so if you're weak in one, it could actually hurt the others. Um, and then if you're excessive in some, like your fingers, right, then you can't scratch your ear and you can't pick up pencils. So that's going to be problematic as well. Well, virtue, because it's a description of our character, the virtues are going to be connected as well. And in fact, virtue really is wholeness, right? It's being integrated. Vice is disintegration. It's dis you know, it disintegrates us. It uh, kind of makes us a slave to our, our passions that are unreasonable and different things like that. We don't have control a lot of the times of the way we act. So virtue integrates us, it's whole, so all the virtues are going to be connected. Um, so it's easy to show kind of the negative side of that, but I'll come back to the positive side when I give the advice in just a little bit. But the negative side of that is, um, so for example, if I am at the dinner table and I just want to eat a lot of this food, right? so I just take as much as I want, that's an example, right? I'm eating too much, more than I should. But if that makes it so my children don't have enough to eat, now that's unjust. So it wasn't just intemperate, it's now become unjust as well. Um, or let's say I'm at a party and I'm of the drinking age, I don't know who here is, but you're at a party and you're of the drinking age, and you've had your limit, right? You know, you're pretty self-possessed, you know, um, this is how many I can have, I'm having a good time, but one more, it won't be a good time anymore. I'm gonna have bad. I'm gonna make bad decisions. But everybody's pressuring you, right? Like, oh, come on, just have one more. You've got to try this one. This, you know, this one tastes really good. Or uh, one more is not gonna hurt, right? And if you think, well, I don't want to be made fun of, or I want to disappoint them, right? That lack of courage that leads you to have one more drink than you should has now made you intemperate, and so now they're gonna be bad decisions. So the virtues are gonna be connected. So right now it seems kind of bad because we think, wait a minute, if the virtues are connected and not having one prevents me having another, and that means if I don't have one, I'm not gonna have any of them. And that seems pretty discouraging. But we're gonna see in just a little bit that actually this should be encouraging, and it's gonna help us to grow in virtue. But we're gonna get to that later. For now, let's just focus on virtue again as making us most free, most human, most ourselves, right? So it's this unifying thing, it's this integrating uh, principle, we could say. And so, the hallmark of a virtue is to act with ease, promptness, and enjoyment. So remember those powers of the soul we talked about before that we have control over, so our intellect, our will, and our passions. Well, it makes sense that if all of those passions are in accordance with the truth, and so they're making us good, they're all in harmony, well then when we act, we're going to act with ease, promptness, and enjoyment. We're gonna act with promptness because we're not gonna have to deliberate about what to do. As we grow in virtue, we have to do a lot of deliberate. We have to kind of study ethics, we have to look toward people, we have to kind of judge our own actions, examination of conscience. What did I do that was good? What did I do that was bad? How can I improve? Right, so we deliberate what is the right thing to do in this sort of circumstance. But when we become virtuous, it kind of becomes a second nature to us, so we don't need to deliberate. So our actions come to us with promptness, they come to us with ease, so our will is not divided anymore. A lot of times the will is that kind of middle of the tug of war between the reason and between the emotions. And it gets pulled one way by reason, another way by our emotions. Um, and sometimes we choose one, or sometimes we choose the other. I think there's so many times that we've experienced this, right? Okay, I always get frustrated with this person, insult them, I'm not going to do it this time, right? I'm going to be just polite, and look at that, it happened again. Right? They got her under my skin, and I insulted them. I mean, how many times has that happened where we're prepping ourselves, we're like, I'm going to do it this time, I'm not going to be afraid of this thing that I know is irrational, <laughs> but then I run away screaming, right? How many times has this happened? So, the person with virtue doesn't have that struggle because the will and the reason and the, and the emotions are all gonna be in harmony and concert, so you can act with ease. So we talk about promptness, ease, but also enjoyment. So think about it. If the person, and actually maybe I'll backtrack a little bit. So how do we get to this point where we can act with ease, promptness, and enjoyment? There's kind of like four ingredients, there's four steps to it. Um, that are going to fall through the power. So first of all, you need to know what the good thing to do is. You need to know what the good is. If you don't know what is good, then how are you going to choose it? Right? So you need to know what's good. So this is why it's important to study ethics, why it's important to look to the lives of the saints and things like that. Uh, you need to know what the good is. Otherwise, if you just do the good by coincidence, it's not really virtue. It's not making you better. It's just a happy coincidence. So you need to um, know what the good is. You need to choose the good. But as I just described, there are many times we choose the good, but we don't act on it. This is what I want to do, 
but then I did something else. St. Paul talked about that, right? Why is it that I do what I hate? Why does that keep happening? Okay? Now, Paul had virtue, right? But he's just talking about this struggle that he was having. So you need to know what the good is. You need to choose the good. You need to actually do the good, but also enjoy the good. And this is the hardest part. Right? This is kind of a crowning achievement of virtue. But it makes sense. If the, it's not just the intellect and the will that are in union, but our emotions as well. And if we really understand to really comprehend how good an action is, then we will enjoy it, even if it is difficult, even if it is kind of a struggle to do. Right? It might not be like jumping for joy, butterflies in my chest. I mean, the martyrs certainly, I mean, sometimes the way they write it makes it sound like they did kind of feel that way. If they did, it was a grace. Um, but we can do very difficult things. We don't have to be jumping for joy, but we can still enjoy the fact that it is the good, that we know that we're doing what's right. St. Thomas Aquinas said that it's sufficient to just not be sorrowful. Right? Some things, like martyrdom, we're probably not going to be excited about. <laughs> but as long as we can rest in, you know, this is the good, and this is what I want to be doing, standing up for my faith, right, then it's still a virtuous act. It's a virtuous act. So, ease, promptness, and enjoyment, right? There's going to be an enjoyment of doing the good as well. All right. So that, that hopefully has a good kind of recap on what virtue is, kind of main point saying it's a perfection of our character, which is to say it's a perfection of our capacities to choose different activities, determines them to something that's reasonable, not unreasonable by means of excess or deficiency, and it's something that um, helps us to act with ease, promptness, and enjoyment. So, how can we grow in virtue in college or high school or homeschool or anywhere else? So I've got four main kind of general bits of advice that I want to give, and then if we have questions, um, certainly you can get more specific there. But the first one, the first bit of advice that I want to give is one that might sound counterintuitive or might sound inconvenient. And it is that you should probably start with little things. Now, I think our impulse is, well, I want to be good. I'm sick of sinning. I'm sick of like my failings. I just want to be virtuous now. So let me go out and do these big things. That's our impulse, right? But I'm going to tell you, sometimes that works. Sometimes you're inspired, and that, and that can work. But most of the time, we go out, and we try to do these big things, and they don't go as well as we want them to. Right? Maybe we're successful, maybe it's a mitigated success, maybe we're not, it's an epic fail. Right? Maybe it doesn't work at all. And so we can get discouraged pretty easily. If we go out and try to do those big acts of virtue before we really have virtue, high chance that we're going to get disappointed. Um, also, those big acts don't come that often. So remember back to our definition of virtue, it's a habitual and stable disposition, right? This, it's our character. It's something that has to be built, and so there needs to be the repetition of these sort of acts. <clears throat> Sorry, I got distracted by the sound, and then I was thinking about something earlier in the talk. Okay, we need to, um, what was I just talking about? I totally lost my mind. Start with little Starting things. With little things. Yeah, little things. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start with these little things. If we start with the big things, um, it's easy for us to get discouraged. Now, if we start with little things, immediately we're going to start to grow in virtue. Because remember, our automatic reaction was, well, I want to be virtuous now. Is that impatience? <laughs> right? We've got to remember that things are happening in God's time, not our time. If we're happening in our time, yeah, we would be virtuous now, but... It's not possible a lot of times. You need these repetition acts, right? So immediately, if you start with the little things, patience and humility you're practicing. Because you admit your weaknesses, you acknowledge the fact that this is going to take time, and it might even take our whole lives. Right? That's not to say that you're not going to keep growing in virtue. It's not an all or nothing thing, right? You can grow in virtue, but to really get to where you want to be could take our whole lives. I mean, the pagan philosophers, they would say that the virtuous people, you, you had to be an elderly person, that they're the only people that could have prudence, because prudence takes experience, and you don't have experience until you've lived life. And so only the elderly people even had a chance of being virtuous. Now, that's not going to be the case for us with grace, but I'm going to come back to that at the end of the talk. Okay, so start with these little things. Now, it's going to help us to grow right off the bat in humility, in patience, also perseverance. Because as I said, these big heroic acts of virtue don't come that often. The little acts, they're all over the place. We encounter them thousands of times a day. So there's constantly 
little things that we can do to grow in virtue. So this is gonna help with perseverance, right? We need to develop that habit, that stable disposition. So we're gonna have a lot of times, because we're gonna fail a lot of times, but hopefully we're gonna succeed a lot of times too. And so since there are so many different opportunities to practice these virtues, even if we fail, we can say, all right, I messed up that one, I'll get the next one. That one again. So now this one, right? But we can keep trying. We have a lot of different opportunities to grow in those virtues. But also, just because I'm saying start with small things, doesn't mean they're not intense things. Remember I said to grow in a virtue, it's growing in this intensity. And the intensity is the rational mean or the rational mode, which is how reasonable a thing is. And you have to surpass the intensity of your virtue in order to continue to grow in virtue. You can do little things with great intensity. This is what St. Therese teaches us, right? Doctor of the church, the little way, to do little things with great love, right? Even the smallest thing that we can do, if we do it with great love, that's going to have a great intensity to it. That's going to help us progress in virtue faster than if we did some great thing with a little love. Right? If we did this great heroic action, it was with a little love, it builds virtue not as quickly as if we did small things with great love. Aquinas, Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas will say that charity, love, is the form of the virtues. It's going to give direction to all of the virtues. It's going to kind of reshape them and orient them toward our supernatural destiny. So love is going to be this key component. Even if we do little things with great love, we'll have a greater foundation to then do those more heroic acts. Right? So that we won't get discouraged, right? We can keep building up. It's a stronger foundation. And it's a greater intensity within those virtues. So we look to St. Therese, Doctor of the Church, for help in that regard. So that's the first bit of advice. Start with these little things. Not to say you can't do big things, right? But this is going to be a good starting point. Now the second bit of advice I would say is to strategize. So this is going to come back to that notion about the connectivity of the virtues that I mentioned earlier. To strategize, okay? I think it was Socrates who said, know thyself. Right? I said how none of us is born with perfect virtue. We have to develop it. But all of us is born with a certain natural temperament. Some things come easy to us, some things are more difficult for us. For some, I've met people like they don't it, they don't get like mad unless it's something really extreme. Um, I'm kind of the opposite, right? I can get annoyed really easily over things that I shouldn't. Um, so we know our strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so kind of do an examination of conscience. What virtues are, am I inclined toward? What vices am I inclined toward? And then our first impulse is probably, okay, let's identify the vices, find the opposite virtue, and work on them. We could do that, that's helpful. Um, but again, if that's the vice that we're struggling with, then we're already struggling in that virtue. So to just try to do that virtue, to just, like I'm just gonna will this virtue, it's gonna be very difficult to do. Sometimes it works, but a lot of times it doesn't. We're trying the same thing over and over and over again. How many times have, well, I won't ask for a show of hands, but if you've had the experience of going to confession, time after time after time confessing the same things, all right, now that can be good because we're getting the grace to help us to grow in it, but also, it could be because we're also trying the same way over and over again, and it's not working. So let's strategize. Let's use that connectivity of the virtues to our advantage. So before, we looked at kind of the negative side. If I don't have this virtue, then I don't have that virtue. But if that's the case, okay, the virtues are connected, and some of them I am inclined toward, or I am naturally strong in. And if they're all connected, then increasing one virtue is going to increase all of the virtues. So if I actually start by increasing the ones I'm already pretty good at, that is going to drag the other ones along with it. And then maybe get to a point where I am more successful in striving for that opposite virtue from those vices. Um, the analogy that St. Thomas Aquinas uses is a hand, and how a hand and its fingers grow. He says it's not the case that like you get the palm, and then like one finger grows, and then your body's like, that was pretty good. Let's do it again. Mm -hmm. And like the second one grows. And then you know, the third and fourth. But they all grow together. And they all grow in proportion. It's not like, okay, the middle finger grows and the pointer finger is like, mine's still not the same height, but it's still growing. Like eventually it will get there. That's not the way it works. Like, unless there's some genetic anomaly. Right? The middle <laughs> finger is going to be the longest finger, the pinky is going to be the shortest, the thumb is going to be hanging out there on the side, all opposable and stuff. Um, but they're going to grow in proportion. The virtues also grow in proportion. Right? So as much, and again, this is one of those things that kind of annoys us, 
Maybe not you, maybe me, a little OCD or something. It's like, I don't just want them all to be equal. I don't know if it's because we're in this age of like sports stats and like video games and different things where you're like, well, why can't I just level my virtues up until they're all the same? <laughs> <laughs> until they're all level 50? Like, why can't I just do that? But they're all going to grow in proportion, right? That's just the way it is. But again, we use that to our advantage. So we work on the ones that we're already pretty good at that's going to drag the other ones along with it, and then we can focus on those more um, directly. Now we can even go deeper than that. So not only can you work on a different virtue to grow on a different virtue, but you can work on a different part of a virtue to grow on that same virtue. So even within, so the classical virtues are prudence, justice, courage, and temperance, but even within them, there's a whole set of sub-virtues. So within, under courage, we can think about perseverance and patience. Under temperance, we can think about chastity and um, healthy eating and drinking the right amount and exercise and different things like that. Um, and this actually is verified by scientific studies on dieting, where they say like, if you have struggled with the dieting, you focus on other areas of self-discipline. Temperance is basically self-discipline. So, I don't know, um, if I, let's make it, I'm thinking of Christendom now, right? So they've got the nice tray of cookies out there for dessert, and maybe I start by like taking five of them every time. Um, and cookies are good, I'm not saying to get rid of the cookies, right? Although would your intemperance would become unjust if there weren't any cookies left before I get there? So just keep that in mind, right? But another way of working on it is, if I'm struggling with um, you know, having too many of the cookies, well, I can focus on other areas of self-discipline. Am I getting to bed at the right time every night? It, do I have a strict schedule? Um, or, or am I procrastinating throughout the day? And this can go other ways. Maybe my problem isn't with eating. Maybe it's with I stay up too late. And so I want to make sure I get to the bed and get to the right amount of sleep. Well, if you keep a strict schedule during the day, you're going to procrastinate less if you can uh, make sure you get up at the same time every day, right? You make sure that you eat and exercise. That will actually help with getting to bed at the right time. It's amazing how that happens. So you can work on one aspect of a virtue in order to help those other aspects of a virtue. Okay, so those are our first two. We said um, to start with the little things. And, and, and actually, I want to say a little bit more about the little things. I want to give some examples. There are so many different things we could do. It's five minutes before class. What are you doing? Well, if there are other people around, maybe you're talking. But if you're just alone, is your temptation to just kind of like look at your phone and start scrolling through things? If you want to work on patience, that's an opportunity right there. I'm going to go these five minutes not looking at my phone. All right, even if it means I'm just staring at the wall, that's an opportunity to grow in patience. Or maybe you could do, all right, this week in my 50-minute classes, not the 75-minute ones yet, but in my 50-minute classes, I'm not going to look at the clock. Right? And if I can get through a week of that, then maybe next week I'll try it in the 75 minute classes, right? That's an opportunity to grow in patience. In some classes it'll be different than others, so maybe it's in this class I won't look at the clock, right? And then we can work our way to the other classes, I won't look at the clock either, right? But these are plenty of opportunities, small things that we can do in order to grow these virtues. Or the cookie thing, right? Okay, I usually eat five. This week I'm just going to have four. And I'll do two weeks of four, and then I can bring it down to three. They don't have to go too far. Like one or two is probably good. Three can be good on a saint's day, on a feast day, right? Because <laughs> the importance of temperance is also knowing when to fast and to feast as well. Okay, so the first one was start with the little things. Second one was um, strategize, know yourself, use the connectivity of the virtues. The third bit of advice will be uh, accountability. Don't make it harder than it has to be. Don't do it alone. Right? We should all be trying to grow in virtue. Um, call on other people, people that are reliable, good friends who are honest but tactful, um, spiritual directors, maybe an RA, somebody that you can confide in and can hold you accountable for trying to grow in virtue. So what are you struggling with? I remember in high school, I had a friend who uh, just swears, a, he would swear a lot, and he wanted to stop. And so the first way that he wanted people to hold him accountable was by punching him every time he swore. <laughs> but then, then he changed that to, maybe I'll just like put a quarter in a jar every time I swear. Um, because he got too many bruises. <laughs> um, so, I'm not saying to do that, right? But when we verbalize our goal, when we express it to another person, when we kind of clarify it in our minds, we're that much more likely to actually follow through with it. 
for one, we put our reputation on the line, because I've told other people are trying to do this, and if we don't, then we look hypocritical and bad and all that. Um, so you can kind of play yourself against yourself there, right, with your reputation, but also just kind of clarifying it for yourself in your mind, verbalizing it, you're more likely to follow through with it. So this is how accountability helps. Also, other people tend to know our weaknesses better than we do. Sometimes we're blinded to our own weaknesses. We don't think that what we're doing is wrong, and it takes kind of somebody pointing it out. So this is why the person needs to be honest. They need to be tactful, right, so that they're not just tearing you down, but they're pointing these things out so that you can be built up. You can also trade off, right? Maybe I struggle with temperance, you struggle with justice, and so we're going to help each other. I'll call you out every time you insult somebody unknowingly. You call me out every time I'm up too late or sleep in too late, right? Hit me with pour water on me or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got um, accountability. So the last bit of general advice I want to say is, drum roll, as I try to remember what it is. Um, the last bit of advice I want to say is, oh, to seek out virtuous people, okay? So how are we going to learn to be virtuous? All the different virtue ethicists have said the quickest way to do it, because we can study books on ethics, we can go to moral theology class, but the quickest way to grow in virtue is to find somebody who's virtuous and imitate them, because they're the one who's got it. Right? As long as we're studying ethics, it's all kind of theoretical. It's all a little bit abstract. What would you do in this situation? Well, every situation is different. Right? There are certain principles we can follow, but when it comes down to it, every situation is going to have different circumstances. And some of those circumstances are significant enough that it would actually change how you act. And that could be anything. Right? It could be the timing. It could be who you're interacting with. Right? Sometimes what's appropriate with one person isn't with another. Um, it could be you, right? What's appropriate for one person to do isn't appropriate for you to do. Because they're buff and I'm not, right? <laughs> so, we want to know, um, so in order, the quickest way to grow, we want to bring it from the theoretical to the practical. And so to find somebody who's virtuous and to imitate what they do, they're the person who ha does have the experience, they do know how to act in different circumstances, and so you imitate them. Now the problem we have today is, how many virtuous people are there out there? No. Three. Three? I, I'm optimistic there's more than that. But, and in fact, I think that we probably have it good because we probably live in kind of a bubble of a higher proportion of virtuous people than in other areas. Um, maybe, right? That's what I'm, I'm going to believe. That's what I'm going to believe. Okay? Especially, after, especially after this talk, right? Oh, that's pride. Okay. <laughs> So, we want to find somebody who's virtuous, that's hard to do. Hopefully we have somebody in our life that we can look toward. If we don't, I bring back to the lives of the saints, right? The church has already given us a whole list, like more than you can even name, and more Johns than you can even name. Right? Have you ever opened up a dictionary of saints, right? We did when we were trying to name our kids. Poor son is named John. But there are like, wow, there's a lot of Johns out there who are saints. Anyway, being named John doesn't make you a saint. But there are many different saints we can turn toward in order to imitate them. And of course, even beyond that, we have a blessed mother, and we have Jesus, right? Jesus is the wisdom of God. He is virtue incarnate. Right? So sometimes we can think like, yeah, but the saints are a little bit closer to us, or even sometimes the saints seem further away. But Christ is gonna be more, like, he's gonna be closer to us than anybody else can be. We come into direct contact with Christ in each of the sacraments, when we receive the sacraments, we're in the state of grace. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals the Son to us. All right, so if we want to grow in virtue, we turn to virtue incarnate. But so sometimes we feel like we're so far away from that. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals the Son to us. And so we've already got the wise person dwelling within us. Right Before I said how the classical philosopher said, you need to seek out the elderly wise person because they're the only people who could be wise. That wise person's already dwelling within you if you're in the state of grace. The Holy Spirit's within you, guiding you, right? So that you can act with the wisdom of God. So the acts that you do can be in cooperation with virtue incarnate, with the wisdom of God. And so this is why the church says you don't have to wait. For some of us, it will take that long, maybe. But you could have a seven-year-old who's virtuous because for whatever reason, God has given them the grace to do that. Now remember, grace is a free gift. So some, don't get frustrated, right? The point I want to make here is that prayer should be the first and last resort. Too often, it sounds obvious, if you want to grow virtue, pray for it. It sounds obvious, 
But how often do we forget it? I know in my life, I so often tend toward Pelagianism. It's like, well, let me get to this point, and then I'll ask God for help. But I never make it to that point, <laughs> right? Because I need God's help, right? So you start by asking for God's help. The angels agree. You start uh, by asking for God's help, um, and you also end by asking for his help as well <clears throat> to grow in this virtue. Now, again, you could be praying day after day after day, make me courageous, make me prudent, make me just. This just doesn't seem to be happening. Two things I want to say to that. One, and this goes back to maybe even the start of the small things. This isn't for everybody. Personally, I don't like doing it, but I know my wife does, and I see the value in it. Journaling. If you kind of keep a record, you know, journaling about your progress and your efforts. In those days when you do get frustrated, and you will get frustrated, you will get discouraged, because believe me, if you're trying to grow in virtue, the devil wants to stop it. So he's going to try every way he can to discourage you. But in those moments of discourage, you look back and you go, whoa, I've gotten a lot further than I thought. Right? Back then, I was eating 12 cookies. Now I'm down to five. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that was like serving size. That was me, like for Oreos, like a oh, you like Oreos too? Yeah, it's like, a, I thought it was like a sleeve. Like a whole row was one serving size. <laughs> in college, I, I took the double stuff and made it into an octuple stuff by putting all the... <laughs> Here. So, journaling, you can see how far you've come, and maybe you'll look at it and say, whoa, I'm actually worse than I was before, and that gives you the nice kick in the rear to get back to it. Uh, but journaling can be a help there um, for when you get discouraged. But also, think of St. Paul. So St. Paul, obviously a man of great virtue, but even he said, three times I prayed for this thorn to be removed from my side, and it never happened. And God says to him, well, it's in your weakness that you're strong. It's when you're weak, that's when you rely on God. So even without, and I think he prayed three times for it, but Paul's three times of prayer are probably more intense than any prayer I've ever had. Um, I mean, I'm, I pray. Well, and then you think of Monica, right? St. Monica prayed 16 years for Augustine conversion, I think. Well, not as holy as Monica, so maybe 32 years of praying for something. Right? Um, but again, that perseverance. So... St. Paul prays for that temptation to be removed. The temptation isn't removed, but he still grows in virtue. Right? Because he recognizes that in his weakness, he relies on God, and then he becomes strong. And so even with that temptation still there, he's able to grow in virtue. So those are my general bits of advice. So just to kind of recap them, um, to start with the little things, journal along the way if you have to to help you not get discouraged to um, strategize, to think about what naturally comes easily to you, what virtues and what vices come naturally easily, so you can kind of map out, okay, how, what's my strategy for how I'm going to grow? Uh, accountability, to find somebody else who's reliable, um, to kind of help you in that process, and you can even help them in return. And don't forget the saints, right, and their intercession as well, and your guardian angel. And then finally, um, um, to seek out virtuous people. We don't have a virtuous person in our life, um, then look at the lives of the saints. And always, the first and last resort is to pray. Mm -hmm. So that's my advice. I'll open up to questions now if you have any specific questions. I've heard it said, and I think this is true, that today a lot of people mm -hmm. think that it's like better or nobler to be um, a person who, in a given situation, makes the right choice, even though it's really hard and they really struggle for them to do so than a person who, in the same situation, makes the right choice with ease. Like, um, but it seems like the second person would be like the more virtuous person because they've grown to get to that point. Yeah. So like, why, why, do you th why would you think that people think this? Good, yeah, that's a great question. And I think that also goes hand in hand with, um, so I'll, I'll address both, I'll address your question. Also, altruism, sometimes people think it's better to do something without enjoying it than to do something with enjoying it, right? A good thing. So, I, I mean, Fundamentally, I think it's because we're just very confused in our society about what virtue is and that sort of thing. Even Aristotle said, so if a virtue is kind of that rational mode between two extremes, anybody who lives by one of the extremes thinks the mean or the virtue is an extreme. Like we tend to think that whatever we do is, is virtuous. Now, to speak to your question specifically, it seems like when somebody overcomes this great struggle, that that's more virtuous than somebody who does something easily. 
I think the reason for that is, again, we kind of, we can't see the interior of a person. We can see somebody struggle. We can see them overcoming it. We can see their um, heroic effort in overcoming that. When somebody just does something good with ease, we haven't seen any of that. And so I think it's just kind of our outsider's perspective. There we can see somebody overcoming a struggle and doing something good, whereas otherwise we can't. So I think that that's something to do with it. Um, some of it might even be suspicion of virtue itself, like uh, suspicion that either people can really be virtuous. So if it looks like you're not struggling, you're probably not trying hard enough, or maybe you're just disguising, you're hiding your struggle or something like that. So I think sometimes there's a suspicion of virtue. Um, as far as the altruism thing, it's better, and, it, and this I think goes all the way back to Kant. I guess you could even go all the way back to the Stoics in classical. They would say we need to get rid of our emotions, and true virtue is to not be disturbed by emotions at all. And I would respond with that's, that's just not human, right? That's just not possible. We're always going to have an emotional response to something. That would be like removing a power of the soul, right? You can, the powers can be impeded sometimes, right? We're not able to, to use them. Um, for instance, like if we're in a coma or something. But they're always there, right? You can't remove them entirely. And so to say that it's better to not, right, it's only virtuous if you do something with no, it's just not scriptural, right? Even the Beatitudes in Matthew's Gospel, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are mourned, for they will be consoled. Blessed are those who are meek, for they will inherit the land, right? There's a reward associated with it. Now, and then it's not right to think about it as, I do this to get the reward, but the reward is constitutive of the activity, right? Insofar as you act by virtue, you find it enjoyable. Right? It's not something that you can avoid. If you don't want to enjoy it, then you don't become virtuous. Right? It's just, they come hand in hand. So I don't know, did I answer your question? Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Well, I'm not really sure if this is a virtue, but the people that like are easily taken advantage of, if they do like a lot of good for others, like where do you draw the line and where something is virtue and where something is honestly like Push over. It's bad for you. Yes, yeah, so that, that's, there's no easy answer to that, right? That's going to take prudence now, but I'm glad that you raised that. So there are a lot of false virtues. There are a lot of things that look like virtue, but they're actually a vice. Now, in our heads, we might now think like virtue, good, vice, sin. Think of it more as vice imperfection, right? Sometimes vices are sinful, sometimes they're not, right? So if I, like if a spider, I use this example. It's a bad I'm sorry, but if a spider came in right now, and I'm like viciously cowardice of spiders and just run, right? I just leave right now. Like the spider comes in, I leave, I don't finish the talk, right? That's not necessarily sinful unless we think maybe it was an unjust, an injustice to all of you, right? It could become sinful. But if I'm just like alone by myself and I get scared by a spider, right? That's an imperfection, but it's not yet a sin. Okay, so there can be false virtues as well where it looks like, now what's the term humble bragging? Have you heard that before, humble bragging? Or I guess it's like the, the false humility, right? So we all know pride. Pride's pretty easy to identify in narcissism and things like that. And we think, well, then humility must be the opposite. So humility must be like, oh, you did a great job. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. That's actually false humility. That's actually a different sort of pride, right? Humility is knowing your place. And so if somebody congratulates you. If you did a good job, then you say, thank you. Right? Praise God. You helped me to do it. But a lot of times that false humility, no, I didn't do so well, that um, it's actually like you're kind of like fishing for compliments, so it's a different sort of pride. So I'm still getting to the loose question here. So how do we know when a virtue goes too far? Now, strictly speaking, a virtue couldn't go too far, right? If it's the reasonable mode, then you can't become too reasonable, right? You can only become unreasonable in different ways. And so there's not going to, in that sense, there's not going to be like, can't be too virtuous, but it can start to become unreasonable, right? So maybe you um, are just a nice person, you get along with people well, but then people start taking advantage of you. Right? That just goes to show, and I think going back to our advice of knowing yourself and strategizing, if you know that about yourself, right? people start to take advantage of me because I'm very <coughs> nice, well that means you're inclined toward that virtue of kindness, but maybe you're also inclined toward maybe a fear of confrontation or something like that, right? Um, because sometimes 
we're finite creatures, right? We can, there are so many goods in the world, we can only choose so many of them. Sometimes we have to forego one good in order to choose another. Even if that means in a conversation, right? Most of the time I'm nice, but sometimes I have to say, I can't help you with this because I need to do this other thing, which is more pressing or a big responsibility. Right? So part of that is to know yourself and just know, okay, and, and this is where accountability helps because a lot of times people can help us with that. Now there is a slight difference between, for instance, like you'll see the saints where people insult them and they won't do anything about it, but they insult somebody else and now they step up and defend the person, right? So that's another aspect to it where there's some kind of leeway with some of the saints kind of did let people walk on all over them, but they didn't let people walk over others. And so maybe what you need to focus on is not so much am I letting people walk over me, but am I letting them walk over other people? And that might be where the deficiency is. So did, did that help? Okay. Other questions? It's like I've heard that uh, mortification and like fasting and extra stuff is good for building virtue. Are there anything, is there anything else like prayer, uh, fasting, all that sort of stuff? Are there any like other tried and true just that it helps you usually? Yeah, so certainly fasting. So the difficulty with growing virtue so often, if we want to bring our reason, our will, and our emotions all into union, um, for whatever reason, because of the fall, it's the emotions that seem to kind of run haywire. And so fasting, as this type of temperance, really, this exercise of temperance, temperance and courage help to moderate our emotions to make them reasonable. That's why fasting tends to help so much. If we kind of starve some of our emotions, then we're able to see clearly what the good is, and then we can kind of rehabilitate the emotions so that they're reasonable. So you ask, are there any other tried and true ways? So fasting is always uh, a good one. Of course, I said to start and end with prayer. Even fasting should do that. And fasting, that's also something to take up with a spiritual director, because even that we can go too far with, right? We can become unreasonable in our fasting. If I am trying to fast, but that makes me a jerk to other people, because I get headaches all the time and I'm mad at other people, then it's not helping us grow in virtue. Right, so we need to know the right circumstances when to fast as well. Um, so yes, fasting, prayer, I, again, in, in terms of tried and true, I think those are, are, are the big ones. And then it's just the other sort of general advice that I've given. I think of any more.